Victor Igwe is a child of Nigeria and famous in the humanist world as a human rights advocate. He holds a graduate degree in philosophy from the University of Calabar and a PhD from the Beirut International School of African Studies in Germany. He's best known, I think, for his criticism and exposure of witchcraft practices against children. And this has brought him into serious conflict with high profile witchcraft believers. It may also come as a surprise to some that at one time in his life, he trained to be a Roman Catholic priest. In his time, he's been Western and Southern Africa representative of the International Humanist and Ethical Union, research fellow of the James Randi Educational Foundation, a laureate of the International Academy of Humanism and holder of the Distinguished Services to Humanism Award from the International Humanist Movement the Atheist Alliance International and the Centre for Inquiry, Nigeria. He's also been threatened, beaten, criminalised and imprisoned. So this is a remarkable story of survival against the odds, I think. And it's an honour to interview him. Welcome, Leo, and thank you very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now, Let's start. I recently watched a recording of a TED talk uh, you gave in 2017, in which you expressed your pride at what your parents achieved through their own efforts, and that this contributed to your humanism. But you lived in a largely superstitious society, and I also understand your parents are Roman Catholics. Indeed, you even began studying for the Catholic priesthood. But by the time you were a young man, you had rejected both. And that must have been a huge wrench for you. So I wonder if there was any point when the dam finally broke uh, for you, or was it an entirely gradual process of personal reflection? Yeah, I think it was um, a gradual process of personal reflection. Uh, because um, as a child, you're always a little bit cautious not to do something that will really either offend your parents or offend the society, or you find yourself alone. In fact, you try to curry favor, your parents' favor, the society's favor, you try to be in their good books. Even when sometimes they, they are doing things that either you find offensive or you think is wrong or mistaken. Yeah, so I grew up struggling um, with life as the way they think I should live it, and life as I think I should live it. So that was, it is this kind of conflict that eventually helped me uh, in, my, in the process of becoming uh, a humanist. I went through a similar process, I think. But you were born in 1970, uh, which may seem a long time ago to you, but I was, I was married with kids then. Uh, but what changes in attitudes to religion and philosophy have you seen in Nigeria over the past 50 years? Yeah. Um, Have you seen any? Yes, there are. There are changes. There are shifts. But of course, what we, we have to also think about shifts that are significant. In other words, the ones you can measure, especially when you are looking at the society from outside. Because there are so many factors that really make it possible for certain changes to be seen or certain changes to be you know, going on underneath, okay, like when I was born, um, it, it was fashionable then to identify with the Orthodox churches, that's the Anglican, the Catholic, the Methodist, uh, because these churches had the schools, they control the schools, they control the hospitals, and these are important mechanisms, structures, and structures and infrastructure in uh, ensuring the smooth running of every society. When people get sick, they need to go to a hospital, access healthcare, and the, the Catholic church, the churches, the Christian groups were controlling these places. And of course, I, that was the case also in the Muslim part. The Muslims were also controlling them. The Muslim and the Christians were kind of competing in terms of influence, depending on the number of schools they had in a place, the number of hospitals they had in a place. So, it was really um, fashionable to see people not 
to say anything critical of these main line churches or establishments. Yeah. Because that means that you may be denied access to healthcare and access to education, which a lot of people need, you know, long for, wanted in order to climb the social ladder, okay? Now, but of course we got these churches so many, and we also got, you know, the Pentecostal influence from the United States. In other words, very rich evangelical groups who actually thrived on criticizing the mainstream churches. So, so you know, in the 80s, we started having a shift whereby now people could criticize, but they criticize with the idea or with the intention of establishing better churches. Yeah, living churches. They, 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 they regarded these Pentecostal churches as living churches. Then the Orthodox Catholic, they are dead churches with doctrines. They don't, they are not Bible preaching churches. They are based on the dogmas, you know, forged by the popes and the bishops and all that. So we saw the criticism now shift to those who want to establish um, uh, Pentecostal churches. But since, say, okay, sure. yeah. No, I was just saying, it all seems totally bewildering uh, with, with the competition there. Yeah. But just coming back to humanism for a moment, can you describe the circumstances of your first exposure to humanism. Um, I wasn't exposed to humanism until I was actually older than you are now. So I oh. wonder if you can recall what, your, what the circumstances were of your first exposure to humanism. Okay, yeah, the circumstances, first of all, I studied philosophy. Yeah. Ah. So in the course of my philosophical studies, one of the schools of thought was a humanist school of thought. And as a young person, I was very curious, you know, and I read a lot, everything I could read. I read Sigmund Freud, even though I didn't understand some of them very well at that time. Oh, me. <laughs> <laughs> but I was fascinated by the ideas and a kind of by their ability to think freely and express the ideas. Bertrand Russell's argument against the existence of God fascinated me. So, and, but they, they tried to uh, present humanism as um, a philosophy that had corrupting influence, religiously corrupting influence. And of course, bringing us up and training us as a priest, they will also warn us against philosophy that could corrupt us or corrupt what we are doing. So, but that made me curious. Immediately they tried to tell me, oh, this thing is something you shouldn't associate with. That was where my mind went. So my exposure was, under this kind of situation, I became curious and I wanted to understand more about humanism and humanists. And that understanding continued to grow. And I continued to realize that that's actually what is, you know, how, how also I think and where I'm connected. And this was what happened that when I left the seminary, I now decided to start a humanist association. Yes, I mean, uh... It's always a bit uh, dubious when you're told not to read something or not to study something. And I, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's terrible. They're the warning. That's the red light to me. Yes, that's it. That's a red light. But yeah. the thing is that it could be counterproductive because immediately you tell some people not to do something, the attention will focus on it. <laughs> they become more curious. They really want to understand that. Sometimes they want to try it. <laughs> that's very true. Very true. Yeah. Human nature. Yeah. So, so when you came out about your skepticism and humanism, um, what was your Roman Catholic parents' reaction uh, or your siblings? How did your wider social circle react? Presumably you did tell them. Yeah, yeah well, by the time I came out, I had um, I'd become an adult and um, I had finished my first degree, uh, my bachelor's, and I was like trying to start my, living my own life. Mm -hmm. you know? So I moved away from my parents I wasn't living with them. So I was very far from them. So they were not like monitoring. They just want to know that I have a job and I could pick my bills and take care of myself. So they were not really so much interested in what I was uh, believing or not believing, but they were, just wanted me to get my place in life. But of course, uh, some of my family members, some of my relatives were very uncomfortable. They were aware of it. And they went to my parents to report that I had joined a satanic group, you know, because they say- Satanic group? Has, yes, satanic. A satanic yeah. group. Yeah. yeah, a satanic group. So, because one of them said that humanists uh, were satanists. 
and that he won't want to have anything to do with them. And I didn't see anything satanic, anything Satan in, in associating with humanists, you know. So, um, and uh, he took some materials to my father uh, on humanism, and my father invited me for a meeting. And uh, when we finished having the meeting, my father told me, look, some of the things that humanists said were true, you know. So eventually my father now became more open to humanist ideas, and he actually attended some of our meetings, you know, just to find out things for himself. And I must tell you, he enjoyed, you know, some of the meetings he attended. And um, actually what the relatives said that, okay, I ended up now converting my father to, to humanism and all that. So even though my, my father continued to identify nominally, you know, as a religious person, which of course is very important, I understood. But I think he was quite a very open-minded, skeptical fellow, you know, until he died. But I, I think I read somewhere that your father was actually attacked because of his humanism. Is that right? Yeah, because of, uh, maybe because of his stance and because of the work we are doing, the human rights work we are doing, a lot of people, you know, he was attacked under a circumstance that we suspected that um, some of the people who were unhappy with the work, the human rights work I'm doing and we're doing in the community, of course, wanted to get back at us and get, get back at me. And that was how, um, that was um, what led to the attack. And he lost one of the eyes, yeah. Nasty. You describe a method of critical thinking called I doubt. And I'm intrigued by that. You label the five doubts you have in mind. I wondered if you could describe them here for our readers. Well, the, the thing is that I have always asked myself, how could we you know, establish a more doubtful society as opposed to a faithful society? Because we talk about faithful, the faithful society and people being religious. So, and I'm trying to see what are different ways to really draw attention to the fact that doubting is part and parcel of everyday life and is resourceful and it's actually a mark of intelligent people and societies and not the other way around. So I, I try to you know, uh, use what I call the I doubt mechanisms uh, whereby I have um, the individual doubt. And here I was trying to explain the fact that uh, it's part and parcel of our chemistry personal chemistry to cast doubt you know, at ideas. So a, a lot of people might think that, oh, there is something special in some people who, who doubts. You know, you need to be a skeptic to, to cast doubts. No, it is part and parcel of our chemistry and lived experiences. Mm. I, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you 100%. I think yeah. one thing that we should treat, teach our children is critical thinking. That's the most important thing, I think, that you can actually... Uh, teach them. I'm, I'm not necessarily talking about doubt, but at least, you know, to be analytical and to be challenging about, uh, yeah. about what you hear and make your own mind up rather yeah. than other people make it up for you. Yeah. But I understand that you're working to introduce the subject of critical thinking in primary schools in Nigeria. Yeah. But I just wondered um, whether you are designing some sort of course yourself. Uh, and if you, if you are, do you anticipate any resistance to this idea? I mean, I think we could do with some primary school training on critical thinking in the UK as well. And perhaps it might be useful for us too. But are you thinking of designing something yourself? Yes, I'm working on that. And uh, I, I intend to actually make it one of my projects part time um, to, to design um, critical thinking materials for primary school. Because we keep talking about creating a critical thinking society. We want our children to think critically, but do we teach them to think critically? That's a question. Do we have subjects that really get them to think critically? Some years ago at the World Economic Forum, uh, critical thinking was among the top skills. They said that people need for the 21st century economy. But I was asking myself, here in our curriculum, tertiary education, secondary education, primary education, do we have a subject that actually prepares, that nurtures critical thinking in our children, in our, children our young people? So that's why I, I took it upon myself to you know, start this um, critical thinking as a subject, and I'm working to develop it, and we are making some progress, I must say. But yes, we have received some resistance. We have received some opposition because 
I can recall some some months ago, uh, some time ago, I told them uh, a fellow that I was doing, this, I was to introduce this subject in schools, and the person was worried. I said, "Ah, oh, yeah, but I hope you are not going to introduce a subject that will make people to question the idea of God." Okay, so mm -hmm. a lot of people are also worried that critical thinking could dampen or undermine religious belief. But I've always told them that it's the same thing with science. Yeah, so there are people that are worried about that and they will, they will, they will try to resist it. Yeah, but I am making efforts to ensure that people understand that it is not all about religion. It's all about our thinking critically. Then if at the end of the day, erroneous ideas, superstitious ideas will have to fall away, then so be it because that will be better for our society. Uh, can I just say that uh, we're in the middle of an interview right now, but uh, <clears throat> I really think this is really so important. Uh, and I would like to say here that uh, I'd like to uh, make some connection with you uh, and, and in support of what you're doing through Humanistically Speaking. Um, and I hope we can we can arrange something there because I think British kids need it too. I think, yeah. I think British adults need it too. Yeah, yeah. Frank. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, exactly. I, you know, this is something I think is critical, really, really important. Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. So uh, we, we've got a lot of news here about uh, Nigeria and changing the subject slightly here. Um, and Nigeria, to me, is, is so rich in natural resources that I would have thought it should be one of the wealthiest countries in Africa, certainly. Um, and, but it seems increasingly clear to me to be a nation that's at war with itself i mean can you expand a little on, on what you think of that uh, are the basic reasons for that because all well, the news we get from nigeria seems to be bad news yeah 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 i mean it, it's bad i must tell you and we are as i'm talking to you here and i find it difficult to travel because of the risk of being murdered killed attacked by bandits and criminals and headsmen or fanatics or Boko Haram, jihadists, I mean, all sorts of criminals going around in different forms and shades. Now, what is wrong with Nigeria? Nigeria is not an entity, it's a nation of entities battling to dominate the entire entity. That's a, that's a, that's a problem. Are, Nigeria has lacked that internal coherence that comes with common citizenship, whereby every Nigerian is treated equally. Instead, some in local interests like ethnic, religious factions are competing to dominate Nigeria that you know. And this competition has made it such that Nigerians now spend a lot of time fighting each other. Yes. And when a country, constituents, constituents of a country spend time fighting each other, they weaken themselves and they make themselves vulnerable to being conquered by any aggressor from outside. So that's why Nigeria is weak. Nigerians spend their energy fighting themselves, not tapping into their potentials, not connecting with each other in a way that is so robust and that is less vulnerable to external aggression. So that is really the case. Again, and I must add, there are also a lot of external forces who are interested in Nigeria and who, are, who continue to indirectly and sometimes directly fuel this, weakening the country and making it vulnerable so that it could serve their interests. For instance, we have these jihadist groups. Jihadist groups is a global uh, campaign going on. Of course, their, 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 their vision, their dream, their program is to conquer and next subjugate any part of the world and they have they are taking advantage of the weak states so we see them now taking advantage of the weak state institution in nigeria so nigerians need to really come up with internal cohesion realize internal cohesion that can enable themselves build a formidable nation then tap into those riches and resources which are now being wasted you know by nigerians uh, fighting themselves and wasting themselves at the end of the day. So you see the, the jihadists as uh, an outside influence, do you? It, it, it doesn't come from within Nigeria. It comes from an outside organization outside of Nigeria. Is that what you think? 
Yes and no. Okay. There is a local dimension to it because Islam was introduced through war and violence. Yes. Of course, there are scholars, but these are scholars that has double face. At one point, they are preaching. At another point, in the leader, they are they 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 are, they, are, they, are they, they, they they have a lot of followership. They become very violent. When they are in the minority, they are very quiet, and they will be telling you they are peaceful. They are going about preaching. No, and immediately they are in the majority. They now become violent, and they now start killing people either for blasphemy or for apostasy and for you know related crimes against their religion. So. There is a local version of it, but that local version is being emboldened, is being mobilized and energized by the external influences, especially coming from the Middle East. All right, that's what I suspected. Thank you. Now, <clears throat> you're known, uh, let's be specific, among other things, for defending child witchcraft accusations in Nigeria. And I think the rest of the world frankly, must be a bit dumbfounded, to say the least, by how deep ideas about witchcraft still exist there. Um, are these ideas fed into children in school in the same way that uh, religion is fed into our children here? Or, or are they cultural, passed on from parent to child, as it were? Or are they both? Both. Both. For witchcraft accusation, witch persecution, to persist and to have these very graphic, very, very horrific impact. So many factors, so many forces are at stake, reinforcing the same thing. So the belief is handed down from parents to children. The belief is reinforced by the educational system. And they reinforce this directly and indirectly. And I want to tell you that I wanted to go to a school to uh, promotes critical thinking. And the owner of the school told me, please, when you come here, please don't tell, don't tell my children, don't tell the school people that witches do not exist. Okay. So this is in schools. The a school taught in schools about a witchcraft. school. A school. I am saying a school. Now, this is why I'm developing so many programs that might directly and indirectly get children to begin to question. Because sometimes if you want a direct uh, frontal, you know, a kind of, you want to really confront it that way, they will resist you. They will not want, want you. Media houses don't want you to come and say there are no witches, a witchcraft is superstition. Schools don't want you to come and say that in schools, okay? So that is why I'm trying to develop a lot of programs, critical thinking, creative thinking, and of course, other humanist, humanist related programs that can give us a place to provoke, maybe stimulate or inspire people to begin to question ideas because it's all about questioning ideas and ability to think critically that can help us address this. So mm -hmm. schools reinforce the idea because they shut down the critical voices or they shut them out. So, so that is how at the end of the day, even within schools, we have a, a case in Liberia, as I'm talking to you here now, where school authorities expelled a seven, six-year-old girl because of suspicion and accusation that um, she, she was a witch and she could, you know, infect or attack others. Through this was, a, this was just somebody who said, just accused yes. her of being a there witch. Were, there were some rumors, of course. And these are rumors that school authorities should have dispelled. This would have been an opportunity to invite a psychologist, a philosopher, to expose the children to critical thinking and how they should react when they are told anything. Instead, the school authorities in Liberia bought into this and expelled this young girl. And the girl is finding it difficult now to get into a school because the school year has started. It's coming to an end in June. Many schools are also not reluctant, are reluctant to accepting her in because of that. At the pro, at, as I'm speaking to you here, that girl, Catherine, is not in any school. They're making efforts to get her enrolled. So this is, this is the role our schools are playing, reinforcing the idea. 
So this is why this witch persecution is going on. And I started an advocacy for alleged witches, a campaign with a, a vision to end witch persecution in Africa in 2023, sorry, in 2030. And the vision is that as a continent, we should put an expiration date on witch persecution. We can't just allow this thing to continue. We should mobilize, get everybody to say, yes, we are stopping this in our family, in our country, in our country, in our region, everywhere we are. So that's the, that is on one side, one of the also programs and campaigns I'm running to see how we can end which persecution of children or elderly persons. Imagine in Malawi, they are stoning alleged witches to death. This happened this year. It happened last year. We have had cases about like that, you know, and all that. So the, the situation is serious because some of the institutions that could help weaken the belief and all that, they are instead, you know, either, you know, reinforcing the belief or doing nothing when these atrocities are committed. It seems absolutely appalling. But your, your comment about Catherine uh, leads me on nicely, actually, to the next question was that uh, I note that you've remarked in the past that women and children in yes. particular, I thought more likely to practice malign witchcraft, whilst men are more likely to be benign. I yes. mean, can you expand a little more on the place of women uh, in Nigerian society? Is it any different from the way it is in Britain? Well, um, for, Niger for the Nigerian society, women occupy weaker social cultural positions. So it is very easy to get rid of them. It's very easy to place the label of witchcraft on them and use that to justify persecution, exclusion, oppression, or any form of harm. But if men's okay. a witch, it's good, right? Yeah. <laughs> you said? <laughs> it's laughable. Yeah. 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 So, so, so that is, that, this is exactly what is going on, you know, and, um, and, uh, so what we're trying to do now is to draw attention to the position of women. And in fact, what we try to do now is to empower them to resist, to challenge, because men are seen as more important and more of the a defender of the family. So whatever they do, when they indulge in any kind of magic or alleged to have been involved in any form of magic is actually seen more as something that will protect the family, not harm it. But women are easily identified with harm and betrayal and destruction and injury, you know, much more than men. So it makes it that women now constitute, you know, majority of the people who are at the extreme, who find themselves at the extreme in terms of harm and torture and persecution in the name of witchcraft. It comes down to education, doesn't it? But uh, and uh, it reminds me of a, a phrase that was attributed to Gandhi, where he said that if you educate a man, you educate a man. But if you educate a woman, you educate a family. Yeah, I, I think there's something to something in that. Something very deep. Yes, there is. Yeah. Yes, there is, and that is exactly why one of the reasons why we are failing in this part of the world because we have not put emphasis on the education of the girl child. And do you know what? At the end of the day. Children spend more time with their mothers. You know, sometimes, a lot of men, they travel for, the, for, you know, for jobs. They travel to make money. They travel for businesses. You know, children spend more time with their mothers. Now, now, if the mothers are not educated, it means that there's this, you know, cycle, you know, whereby, you know, uh, ignorance, lack of education, or half education. People get half educated, you know, this is what is going to drive the society. So educating women, putting emphasis on women education should also be part and parcel of the campaign to you know, eradicate witch persecution and witch killing in the region. Absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, just to move on to uh, Mabarak uh, Bala, I hope, that, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly, Mabarak yeah. Bala. Uh, yes, yes. I understand that, the, that, um, uh, that even after a year, He's still in prison on charges of blasphemy uh, after being yeah. critical of Islam. Is there anything that humanists in the UK can do to help him? And if not him personally, uh, then perhaps his family? Because I'm yeah, really he, cool for this guy. Yeah, yeah. 
there's a lot there's a lot we can do and actually, a lot is being done you know you see uh, let us not you know let me not just respond as if nothing is being done at the moment a lot is being done but movement is not out yet so it means that we we, we must we will keep doubling redoubling our efforts until he comes out yes um one of are the you, things that yeah are you able to visit him no, he calls from the prison and the wife has visited. But that was after he was disappeared by the police for over for about six months. We didn't know where he was. We didn't know whether he was alive or dead. We had to campaign. We went to the UN. We went to you know, all the diplomats and all the embassies just to put pressure. Then after that, the wife was able to visit him and he calls now from prison from time to time. But prison is not home. Yeah. And it's almost one year now. He was taken away. He was literally kidnapped. And he has not been charged before any court. He, he has not, he's not being prosecuted. They just abandoned him in a, in, a, in a prison somewhere. And, you know, no word as to when, when and how he'll be prosecuted and released. And we have been telling them, I said, look, they, because sometimes they said, oh, yeah, we are keeping him there for his safety. A place you can be safe is not prison. And this is a misconception we must correct. That people are safer in a society, a civil society, it, it, when, they are, when they make such comments, they are only safer if they are in prison. That's nonsense. And we should reject that. In the UK, and UK humanists who also contribute to the voice and campaign that rejects that. It should not be the case, not only in Nigeria, but anywhere around the globe. I understand he's been moved to an area <coughs> where um, uh, Sharia law uh, is uh, runs the place. So yeah. uh, it looks as though he's been put in the worst possible situation, I would imagine. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Because... Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because what happens there now is that, in fact, we are told that some Muslim groups, they send people to go and monitor the area and to make sure that nobody comes to you know, release it and all that. And what is it? If you try to go there, maybe you, can, you could be killed. A lot of them have been sending me messages. They say, okay, come, come to Kano and release him. If you, are, if you think you are interested in, in, his, in freeing him, come to Kano, okay? So, so, you know, this is a society that say it has laws and it has a government, democratic government, you get it? But it's ruled by mobs, mm -hmm. Islamic mobs. They call the shows. The, the, they are the ones that decide what happens. And the, the government panders to their sentiments and interests and, the, and the, their wishes and what they want. So this is exactly, that's where it is. So we need to put a lot of pressure on Kano state government. Uh, we'll be putting pressure on the Nigerian, state, Nigerian uh, leaders, but they have been showing at the center, but they have, been showing, they have not been showing a lot of interest. So we need to put our pressure on the Kano state government specifically because that was, they were behind and they are behind his arrest and detention without any date for trial or prosecution. So we can't just continue this way. One year after they took him away and kept him in jail and all that, that is not the place he has to be. That's not the place. Blasphemers are not safer. They're safer living in the society like other human beings. They cannot be told, we cannot be told that they're safer living in prison. No, prison is for criminals and he, is not, he has not committed any crime. He has not even been convicted and he has spent already one year in prison. This is totally unacceptable. I, I think I know the answer to, the, to my next question now but from what you've told me. I mean, do you think there is an official and an unofficial government policy towards humanism in Nigeria? Um, I would say that, you know, in principle, in principle, if you look at our constitution, one would say, yeah, you know, this country definitely will have space for humanists. But unfortunately, in practice, Nigeria is not run or managed or governed based on its constitution. Constitution is just a paper, it's a paper tiger. We are governed by religious texts. We are governed by ethnic and sectional prejudices and biases. They overwhelm what is actually written in the constitution. And that is why Mubarak is in jail up to today without being prosecuted, and which is unconstitutional. 
totally unconstitutional. You can't hold somebody for one year without prosecution, prosecuting the person, convicting of any crime. So in principle, yes, if you look at the constitution, you one could think that, yeah, you know, there is an ample space you know, for humanists. But in practice, no, we are actually regressing. Nigeria is going backward. In, 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 in Kano State and other Northern States, they have what they call Sharia police. They go around monitoring people and trying to determine those who are fasting and not fasting. If you are not fasting during really? this month of Ramadan, you could be jailed or you could be detained and nobody will care for you. You could be even attacked. They go about you know, uh, um, looking at your dressing. And recently they arrested a barber because there was a haircut he gave somebody and it looks like Arabic word for Mohammed. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, I mean, well, Nigeria I is, becoming, is becoming an embarrassment, you know, just yeah. because they have allowed themselves to be driven, you know, by, you know, religious fanatics and the religious extremists. And they are afraid of, you know, trying to stop these people, trying to prevent them, trying to limit them, you know, because, you know, they think that they could come after them and their lives and their jobs. So right. this is a shame. I don't question these people are very dangerous, but uh, I mean, have you been in touch with uh, Mubarak yourself recently? Have you been able to speak to him yourself? Yes, yes. We speak uh, at least, he calls uh, about maybe every week or every other week. And sometimes he calls maybe sometimes twice in a week, depending on when they allow him to make phone calls. And, um, and of course we discuss the, the case and the progress and lack of progress we are making and what we could do you know, to see uh, whether there could be a movement or whether he could be released. So I, I'm in touch with him. How is he? Well, is um, he, he's mentally strong, I must say. But of course, he's been, there's been growing anxiety recently because it seems that all the efforts we are making uh, seem not to be making any difference. Of course, not because we're not making efforts, but because those holding him are deaf, you know, they're insensitive. They don't care, okay? They are not caring, they don't care. They only care for the interest of the establishment, which is the Islamic establishment in Kano and all that. And they are now briefed, they have been properly briefed to keep him there you know, against all norms, against every form of decency. So uh, he's been, it has been growing anxiety, but uh, he remains mentally strong. And uh, we keep encouraging him that, yeah, that is um, what we have to do at this moment, uh, to remain civil and to remain strong and to remain steadfast, I used to say, committed to keep putting pressure until he is released. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we've had a few run-ins with the Liberty Gospel Church uh, that's led by Helen, what, Helen Ukabia. Yeah, Ak yeah. Ak yeah. Um, now, it, when I first heard it, the Liberty Gospel Church, it sounded like a Christian church. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it's, its leader famously puts children on trial for witchcraft, so it can't yeah. be Christian. I mean, I know it wasn't long ago when some genuine Christian churches in, in the West put people on trial for witchcraft. It wasn't mm. really that long ago. Mm. But, but can you tell me more about this organisation? Is it a Christian church or what is it? Yeah, it's a Christian church. It's a Christian church founded by a woman who claims to be an ex-witch. Yes. You see, that is a power narrative. You know, what does that, what do I mean? It's a way of making you understand, yes, I used to be a witch, I understand what it means. I'm now out of that uh, group. Now, I can identify them wherever I find them. Come to me, I can help you, you know, identify them. So that's exactly the narrative she sold to people in dominantly uh, uh, superstitious and witch believing areas of the, of, the, of the country. And of course they bought into it. So, and he made them understand that their businesses, family challenges, divorce, lack of progress in their business or in their lives, any misfortune they suffer, diseases and deaths are all as a result as witchcraft powers in the family. And uh, he was very particular with children, you know, being possessed and being initiated. And he produced films you know, that really reinforced these beliefs in people and people started targeting children who misbehave or who display certain threats that she identified, you know, with witchcraft. So this was exactly what happened 
and it led to a lot of, uh, you know, abuses of children in the name of witchcraft uh, in that particular region. So, and you know, when I read about it, like I said, with my exposure to philosophy, and I, I knew about the about the Renaissance, about uh, the witch hunts in Europe, in, in yeah. um, less early modern Europe. Sounds you know, familiar. And, and yeah, and I tried to see a lot of similarity in what the church was doing and what was going on then, you know. So, and I said, oh, sorry, you are in the wrong place and you are in the wrong time, you know. So, and, and I will do everything to make sure that, you know, I, I get the world to understand that this is what is going on. You know, like I said, politically, many institutions caved in. They are afraid. They don't want to be seen as anti-Christian. Or they want to see to be on the side of witchcraft or the side of witches because when you come when you try to confront a church like that they demonize you they, they make you they make people understand that oh you are part of the witchcraft occult forces and all that mm -hmm. and nobody wants to be portrayed in that light so this was why she continued to drive and i said hey i know this cannot happen you know and all that and then because of that you know she, she sued me to court and she's been threatening and sending some of her uh, church members after me, they beat me up uh, in 2009 when I went to organize a program because we wanted to organize a conference on witchcraft beliefs and abuses. I said, take it to the church, the, the city where the church was, was located. That's why I told the organizers, something mm. will not be happening, let's say in London, and maybe you, you are organizing a conference in Manchester, something like that. Take it to London, take it to the place where the, the place has a lot of influence. Well, unknowingly, I thought that they would come around for dialogue and debate and civil discussion, but they took it uh, differently and uh, came down and disrupted our program and beat me up and all that. And also sued me to court, took me to court. So, yeah, it is a tug of war. But I have told them, no matter what they try to do, they cannot win this. They are on the wrong side of history, and the earlier they realize this, the better, whether as a church or as an individual. You see, uh, when, they, when they behave like that, that's a surefire sign that they're afraid of you. They are afraid of you. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't understand, I've never understood why humanism, which is actually a very gentle uh, idea, it, it's, not, uh, it's not confrontational, it's not violent, it's not aggressive, it's not coercive, why people should be so afraid of us. I just do not understand that. Uh, but to actually send her thugs uh, to beat you up is... is it's cowardice, really. But I, I'd, I'd suggest one thing. I'm, I'm perhaps being a bit cynical here. But has this lady made a lot of money in her time? Is she fairly yes, she, wealthy? Yeah, she made a lot of money out of this industry. Accusation, uh, which can exorcism, okay? Because yeah. she would, she, they would invite her to all these big, you know, uh, prayer meetings and all that. And a lot of people would come and, you know, you get exorcised. And you have to sow seeds. You have to do some Thanksgiving. You have to, you know, uh, get money and pay to the church and support the church and support the ministry and all that. So it is there is um, there's an income uh, trend. Or there's a there's an un underlying uh, income generating mechanism built into what you are what one is seeing as a, a exorcism of witchcraft or prayer meeting. So that is it. Oh, well, there you go. Call me Mr. Cynical, if you like. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, just to move on, I mean, you've been beaten up. Uh, you, I believe you've been imprisoned. I mean, have you ever been in fear of your own life? Um, yeah, you see, if you live in Nigeria, even if you are not getting in doing what I'm doing, you will be in fear of your life. Yes. It's a violent could, country, is it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it is. It is, of course. But I'm not trying to say... Um, because there's a tendency for somebody to think that as soon as you touch, if you touch down in Nigeria, somebody shoots you down immediately. That's not what I mean. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> what I'm saying there is that, of course, there are, um, you know, you could be attacked. You run the risk of being attacked. You run the risk of being robbed. And um, in a way that sends a message that the institutions are not working. That's what I mean. So when you are traveling, you are in fear that you could be robbed and the robbers will disappear <laughs> and nobody gets to catch them. You could also be attacked or killed. You could be kidnapped and that would be the end of you and nothing happens. So you run that risk every day, even if you are not doing what I'm doing. So what I'm trying to say here now is that the issue of fear is part and parcel of what people 
you know, live with every day. Now, in my own case, yes, of course, you run more risk when you try to go against some of these people, whether religious fanatics, especially Muslim fanatics, uh, witchcraft believers, witch hunters. But the thing there is that there must be a price for us to realize a, 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 a superstition free society, a society where you know, people can live freely, religious or non-religious people can live freely without uh, you know, quarrels and disputes. They can live together harmoniously. So that is why it's important. A little bit of risk is, 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 is needed for us to really see how we can re-envision, re-engineer, redirect our society along the lines of these ideals. Because, okay, as humanists, we don't believe that manna will fall from heaven. No, no, no. We produce the manna and we throw it up and it now falls. Okay? So that is it. So, and it takes a lot of risk to, to get that done. So I want to live my life. I find it more fulfilling taking a little bit of risk in spite of the fears to make, to see how we can produce this manna and share it out so that whether it fell from heaven or not, that people have access to that manna. And look, there is no afterlife. The evidence is not there. So why can't we take a little bit of risk and see how we can make the best out of this only one life we have? If we don't do this, have we not shortchanged ourselves? Have we not shortchanged others? And what is the reason we are going to give for doing that? No reason. So for me, yeah, there's a reason to, to fear for my life. Muslim fanatics have threatened me. Uh, witch hunters have threatened me. They have tried to attack me. But I still think that let us, like Prometheus, take that little risk and bring the fire of humanity, you know, and see how we can make the best out of this one life we have. Yeah, I was interviewing Mariam Namazi um, about uh, a month ago or a bit more than a month ago. Um, and she struck me as quite a brave sort of person. I asked her if she ever felt in fear of her life. And she's she's been threatened uh, the same way as you have. But she 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 just doesn't see herself as brave. She just sees herself as committed to her cause. Uh, and, uh, you know, what other people do is other people's business. But that's that's the way she she thinks. And you obviously seem to have the same the same attitude, the same approach. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, you, you you've been put into this situation simply for standing up for what's right. Uh, and every humanist and indeed any decent human being would want to offer their support. And indeed, the bravest among us would want to stand alongside you. Mm. But what can we do as fellow humanists to help you fight your campaign? And more specifically, what can Humanist UK do to help the cause in Nigeria? What can we do to help you? Um, what you can do to help me is... To first of all work with me don't work for me work with me like now try to connect with me to understand what I'm doing and how we could do it too often a lot of people who relate to people in somewhere else let's say in one part of the world they tend to have this feeling that they know the they know best what the person needs. <laughs> yes. And because they want to lead the person, there's nothing like, I prefer partnership. Don't stay in front of me, I may not follow you. I don't want to stay in front of you, you may not follow me. Stay by my side, let's hold each other. Now, connect with me and understand me and let me, let's, let's find out what I need, okay, to really do the work. Don't work for me. Don't think for me. I want to think for myself. I'm the one in this situation. You know? So it is important that they drop this model. Many NGOs do. They stay somewhere else. They decide your funding, your transportation, what you do. And they just send it to you and say, okay, implement this. No! That's a mistake we have been making all this while. Let them find a way to connect with me and with those of us who are in this part of the world, so that somehow, even though we are using their support, but we can use that our support in a way that we can make difference to our situation here. 
I, I don't want a situation whereby tomorrow, if maybe a certain funding is not coming, a program ends. No, I want us to have programs. There are programs I'm putting in place. So if I don't get support from you tomorrow, that program will keep moving. In other words, because it is well-grounded, it is driven by local efforts, but with international support. Yes. So the mistake that is being made too often is that look, internationally, people want to drive everything you are doing to the minutest detail. So that any day that international support goes away, the project collapses. Africa has become a symmetry of such initiatives. And I don't want that for the humanist movement. I want to leave behind programs that will continue from one generation of humanists to other generation of humanists. Now think about it. The humanist UK is, is there today because those, of, those who lived there in the past had this foresight. They put in place mechanisms that have made this organization to survive. Yeah. Also, they should think about the same way when it comes to what we're doing today. So let them connect with us. Let them help us also put in place structures, programs, and mechanisms that will outlive me and outlive them. And the only way we can do it is for them to connect with me and work with me, not for me. Well, Leah, thank you so much for that. I'm going to make sure that we keep some sort of uh, dialogue uh, open between us because I think that's really important. Uh, and uh, I want you to know that we're 100%, 110% behind you. And if there's anything we can do, we will do it by consultation with you uh, and, and through uh, hopefully improved understanding. Now, we're, we're nearing the end of, of this interview, and I just want to um, check with you. Are there any issues that you would like to raise now? Um, are, are there any things that you think I might have missed that you think you would like to raise and discuss? Well, I think that... Have I put you on the spot? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. It, it helps me It helps me make a point I, either I skipped or I have not made. So, um, I think that, uh, first of all, I want to commend many humanists across the world who have looked beyond their borders and who think it's worth their time and their energy to support activists in many countries, in many parts of the globe. If we have a future, if there's a future for the international humanist community, this kind of attitude, this kind of disposition is going to be what will guarantee that future. I know that there's a tendency for us to think, ah, yeah, you know, how do you say, is it the populist, the anti-immigration, the, you know, a kind of the world, people should take care of their problems wherever they are. Well, let's take care of our problem wherever we are and all that. There's a, a tendency for people to keep looking inward and thinking that, oh, we have enough problem, why should we care? Yes, it makes sense, but not enough sense, okay? Because by and large, the world is a global place. When you stay on aircraft, you find it difficult to make difference, difference between even the continents, except the oceans. And remember that all, all those oceans, we also have things going back and forth from, from water to everything. So what am I saying? We are just people living on just a, a patchy part of a global, you know, of a cosmic, you know, universe, you know, that is wondrous as we look at it. So let us not use ideas that really short change, that short change us, that, that make us weaker as a community. So let us come up with forward looking ideas that will, you know, help prosper us and translate our ideas, what we claim as universal humanism into a universal mechanism. So I, sometimes I, I notice this idea of uh, people you know, trying to say that, ah, yeah, uh, well, humanism in one part of the world and they look inwards and all that. Let's try to look outward. And for those in other parts of the world, they also find a way to look, you know, outward and connect with humans in other parts of the world. I believe that with that sense of solidarity, with that sense of connection, with that sense of international understanding, we are going to withstand the pressures and the risks, you know, that exist in some parts of the world. We are going to overwhelm those who want to really conquer the world and, you know, implement Sharia or implement their religious dictates. And those who think, who want to shortchange us, more especially those who want to deny us the ability and capacity to achieve happy and good life in what is only 
in this world, which is what we know, and in this life, which only one life we have. So we should not allow them. We should resist them. Remember that if we stop, if we refuse to resist them, we are finished. There is no afterlife. There's no second chance. If, if they come with the illusion of giving us a second chance, we should tell them bold, boldly and courageously, there is no second chance. We should not shield, we should not retreat and all that. We should make it clear and use all the mechanisms. There is no second chance for whites. There's no second chance for blacks. There's no second chance for colored people. There's no second chance for everybody. We should not make it and say it is West versus Africa. No, there is no second chance for human beings. And we should rally all the resources to send this message and make sure that they resonate, not only within our community and country, but around the globe. Yeah, I, I think there's, I absolutely agree with that. I think there's, um, uh, uh, another another side to that as well it's not just giving uh, to people it's not even just sharing it's there's a self-interest uh, here as well it's like freedom if, if if one person isn't free no one's free and yeah. i think that applies to humanism as well so we have to deal with this collectively as yeah. as as a worldwide movement yeah. and um i mean humanistically speaking has only about five percent of its readers are across the world now, but yeah. we hope to expand that and uh, and, yeah. and and increase that and increase that dialogue between between humans. Yeah. yeah, I've just got one last question for you, and this okay. is a person, this is a personal one. Okay, um, what's been your proudest humanist moment? Just to lighten the conversation, what's the thing yeah. that you've done or that you've achieved that you're most proud of? Ah, uh, well, I think I will qualify that by putting an S at the end. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah I, will not, I will not tie it to one, but I will just scale it in terms of priority. I think in 2001, I organized the first humanist conference in Sub-Saharan Africa. Really? Under one of the most difficult conditions I ever imagined, because we didn't have all these facilities of transferring money. And of course, I wasn't very financially buoyant. And in fact, they sent me a check from the um, Council for Secular Humanism in the UK. And I, I took it to the bank and the bank told me that the check will clear after the conference. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, and I had announced the conference and nobody, because it was a humanist conference, nobody wanted to associate, assist me, succeed in it and all that. And all my guests were coming mainly from outside my region. And I was in a dilemma. Yes. So um, what I did, I had to courier the check back to the United States. And when I went to the post office, they told me that they, they, were, they, they did not accept check. They did not accept check. They can, could not send it for me. And the woman told me, unless you, you, you put on it letter, just call it a letter, don't call it a check. Now, look, if I call it a letter and call it a check, it means that if anything happens, I can't make any claim. But I got to a point whereby I had no other choice but to create a check of $4,000 back to the United States to get them cash it and send it back to me as Western, through Western Union. So I had no other choice and I put letter on it. My hand was shaking as I was putting letter on top of a $4,000 and I'm a Nigerian. And if anything gets wrong, they'll say, oh yeah, you know Nigerians, that scammers, he must have used up the money and he said that he sent it as a check. So yeah. let me be honest with you. I must tell you that at a point I contemplated taking my life if that check does not get to the United States. Good grief. That's heavy. Yes. Because I knew that that would be the end of my reputation, you know, in the movement and nobody will ever believe me. Okay. So for two weeks, I was thinking what happened. Sometimes I walk into the same post office, look around, I said, look, I'll just come and throw myself here if my check just didn't get to, you know, and all that. I didn't know what to do. So 
I waited and waited. I waited and waited what was going to be define my life and all that until one day I went to the internet and the first message I got was that your check arrived yesterday and I have paid it into my account. I will send you that money by Western Union. Look, David, I came back to life. <laughs> okay? I well, came back to that. life. Okay? <laughs> And by then, the guests have started writing and said, okay, when is the venue? Who is coming to pick me at the airport? They didn't know that the money to come and hire taxi drivers to come and pick them at the airport had not arrived. I had no money, no money, okay? Now, all those coming from the United States are confirming their tickets. Some are saying they're coming and all that. And I, when I read, when I see any mail from attendees, my heart will be beating very fast, you know, and all that. But as soon as that money reached, the guy cashed it and sent me back the money. I went. I was like flying. I wanted to fly. <laughs> Let me tell you. Okay. So, so I was able to overnight pay for the hall. You know, you know, I show everybody, no worry, don't worry, everything will be okay. I will send drivers in two different directions to go and pick somebody <laughs> from the airport, from the car station, and all that. Yep. And I make follow phone calls. So what am I saying? I was called that one of my proudest moments. And <laughs> the, the conference was held each free and everybody went back home without any problem. So that is what I'll tell you it was my proudest moment. But let me not sound so selfish here. Yeah. Another proud moment was when I stood before the African Commission on Human and People's Rights for the first time in its history to have a humanist organization present, make a statement before the commission on the rights and interests of humanists in Africa. So these were two of my proudest moments, but I'm sure from this explanation, you should know the one that is I'm prouder for. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got the message, Leo. Yeah. Leo, it, it, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. I, it's been a real, real pleasure and a real joy. And I, I hope this is the beginning of, uh, of a, an ongoing dialogue between us, uh, yeah. with humanistically speaking. We want to go international. We're certainly looking at that. Um, and I know that um, Maggie Hall, who you know, uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is very keen and so is David. So I'd just like to say thank you so much. I look forward very much to seeing you again sometime. And um, hopefully you'll come to the UK and I'd yeah. love to meet you. All right. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.